Welcome to Charter California Edition. My name is Brad Pomerantz. I'm glad you're with us. Over this half hour, we'll be speaking with three individuals relating to the environment. We'll be speaking with Robert Garcia. He is the Vice Mayor of Long Beach, recently appointed to the California Coastal Commission. Then we'll be speaking with a professor from Cal State Long Beach. As you may know, the great white shark is being considered for the endangered species list. We'll get Professor Lowe's view on that. And then we'll be speaking with an advocate for California natives from the Theodore Pain Foundation, but we start with Robert Garcia. All I can say is congratulations, well, thank sir. You. Thank that you. is a huge appointment. No one from Long Beach has ever been on the California Coastal Commission, at least no city council member has ever been on the California Coastal Commission as a full uh, yeah. member. Yeah, I mean, for a full member. I mean, I right. think maybe uh, 40 years ago or so, there was a, maybe a part-time uh, position right. that was up. But yeah, it's been a long, long time. So how did you manage this? I mean, we know you're an effective politician here in Long Beach, but this is Sacramento. It's yeah. a whole other beast. No, I mean, really, first of all, I mean, it's, it's an honor to serve. I think yes. the California Coastal Commission obviously is one of our state's uh, most important bodies. It's uh, protecting the coast, which I think, and like most people think, is the most valuable resource we have here in California, no doubt. obviously. So, um, it's an honor to serve. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a great challenge, but also an opportunity, not just obviously for Long Beach, but an opportunity for any, anyone that's a but coastal. But just a little inside baseball. How, how did it happen? I mean, <laughs> listen, I mean, obviously these, these appointments sometimes are difficult. Right, sure. Um, but it's an appointment that was made by the Senate Rules Committee ah. in the Senate. And uh, I just, you know, was interested. I actually spoke to our, our state senator here in Long Beach, which is Ricardo Lara. And it's nice to know, I read recently, that you've known Ricardo since college. Yeah, we've known each other since so college. That's so nice. A yeah. longtime friend. So right. uh, I knew that the, the seat was up. And so, right. um, you know, Senator Lara and I uh, just started having conversations right. about it. And the, I got, as I learned more, I became more interested. And then I had a, a couple conversations with our mayor, who was very supportive, sure. and then the process began. And with this seat, it's a Senate appointment. It's not a gubernatorial appointment. So you needed to get Senate approval, not assembly, not governor, Senate. Right, through the Senate Rules Committee. And the way it works is mm -hmm. the commission is made up of 12 members. Four oh. are gubernatorial appointments by the governor, four are made by the assembly, and then four are made by the So Senate. what does this mean? Do you have monthly meetings, quarterly meetings? How does this work? So the Coastal Commission meets monthly, oh um, at least uh, for the foreseeable future, sure. it meets monthly. And then you, we meet in a different you know, part of the coast. Right. So uh, my very first meeting, which just recently happened, we met in Redondo Beach. Okay. And then in the next few months, we'll be in San Diego, we'll be in uh, Santa Barbara, now, uh, we'll I, even be in Long Beach soon. I like it. Now, I mentioned to you that we have a bureau in San Luis Obispo, and so the Coastal Commission got a lot of news recently over a request by PG&E to do some seismic testing off the central coast related to the Diablo Canyon nuclear plant. Now, I know you weren't on the board, so right, you, know, right, you weren't right. a part of that, but there is no doubt that the California Coastal Commission has tremendous power. And I don't use that term pejoratively, it's just a fact. Explain the depth of the power of the Coastal Commission. Well, I mean, the Coastal Commission obviously is really entrusted to protect the California Coastal Act, which right. uh, is an extremely important document that really guides any type of uh, development along the coast and is really really laid out to protect the coast. Mm -hmm. And so anything that has to do with development, with public access, uh, with a change of use, with uh, approving uh, coastal, uh, local coastal uses. You, you talk about access. Um, I mentioned to you my father uh, for many years owned a pharmacy in Malibu. He was just a pharmacist. He owned a pharmacy avenue in Malibu. And the Coastal Commission was very much a part of the fabric of the community. And I remember, you know, there were some very Tony homes on Pacific Coast Highway in Malibu, and there wasn't access. It, it, for large stretches, and ultimately, I mean, this is public knowledge, David Geffen, uh, the famous David Geffen, had to create access so that people could get to the coast because the homes were blocking. Right. Um, and, and public access is really important. I think, right. I mean, if anyone wants to develop or redevelop a property that they may, they may own or new developments, maybe right. it's hotels or other things, and, public access is really and important. And let me talk to you about hotels because you think about other uh, major cities, be it Miami, Honolulu, Tel Aviv, the south of France, they have big hotels mm -hmm. on their beaches. They're big magnets for tourism, for business. We don't have those in California. Now, some say that's terrific that we don't have them, right. but query whether we should. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, again, it goes back to this idea that uh, we really value the coast, right? right? And I think that um, our coastal resources is so important, those unobstructed views of right. the water. And I think right now we're kind of in a, in a phase in California where we really want to protect those coastal views. We want to protect kind of that coastal access and um, building something uh, of that, think about uh, the economic boom absolutely. that we and could get if we had, 
mean, you know, maybe just a couple mile strip of big hotels. Well, and I think that the commission has balanced right. that. I mean, it's not like it hasn't approved. There, there, are, there are hotels that are constantly like, approved. It's not like Miami or Honolulu or, you know, south of France where it's like, Right. Yeah. But, but I also think that a lot of those decisions were made at a local level and, right. and, and cities, different cities up and down the coast made decisions about what kind of development they wanted to have. Now, you still are on the Long Beach City Council, of course. Right. And presumably, Long Beach will have matters before the Coastal Commission. Right. I spoke with Gary DeLong recently, for example. He's very proud of uh, there will be the Belmont Aquatic Center is going to be revamped. It's in the coastal zone. Right. So how will that play? Will you be able to vote on those matters? Are you, by definition, conflicted out? No, by actual, legally I can vote on those matters, both at the council and at the, and at the coastal really? commission. Um, Is it because it's public? I mean, everyone knows you're on the... Well, and it's just the way the the, uh, the, the coastal regulations are set. Uh -huh. And so commissioners that are also elected officials, because um, not all the commissioners are elected officials, but commissioners that are right. elected officials uh, are still allowed to vote in their jurisdiction on those issues. What, both ways. Both ways. I mean, the reality is, though, that, we, you know, how you may apply something as a city council member or a county supervisor um, and, and a tricky. local issue I mean, think about might, it. Be, it might be different when, you, when it's at the Coastal Commission. But if you voted, let's, I, I, I believe you voted for the Belmont Aquatic Center. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, how do you not vote for it on the Coastal Commission? Well, I think it actually <laughs> has happened to commissioners in the past. I'm they, sure. They, they, change, they change votes. Really? Because they apply when, when you're at the Coastal Commission, you're applying essentially an interpretation of the right. Coastal Act, and right. you know it is the project before you um, uh, a violation of the Coastal right. Act? Is it, does it need you know a modification? And, and so you're applying a different set of standards. It's very now. interesting, actually. Uh, along the same line, some have felt that the California Coastal Commission has gone overboard, that they have they wield way too much power. Um, what's your sense of those concerns? Well, I mean, I understand the concerns. I, I mean, obviously, um, any matters when it relates to development along the coast is going to go to this 12-member body. Of so that is, uh, that is significant. At the same time, I think the Coastal Commission has had a, a strong history of protecting the coast. One of the reasons why the coast looks um, as great as it does in so many stretches of beach is because the California Coastal Commission yeah. and the California Coastal Act right. has protected those. And so I think that that um, does the Coastal Commission err on the side of coastal protection and uh, preservation? Absolutely, I think as it should. Um, and that's why I think we're fortunate to have the coastline that we do. So do you have any goals in terms of what you hope to achieve? I mean, is that even appropriate? Cause I, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, in a lot of ways, the Coast Commission is kind of a semi-judicial body, and so it's a lot of right. hearings and- Well, like and, the Diablo Canyon situation. Absolutely, I mean, absolutely. They, the State Lands Commission had voted yes. Right. The Public Utilities Commission had voted yes on the seismic studies. Correct. Close question voter, no. Right. Project that's, stopped. Yeah, that's exactly right. right. I think, I mean, honestly, I think one of the biggest issues, if not the biggest issue that will face the Coast Commission over the next few decades is really going to be climate change. Right. And in, climate change is really affecting everything along the coast. And I think that people don't realize that rising sea levels, um, the way that our climate is changing, what's mm -hmm. happening with, with erosion on the beach, that is a huge it's uh, interesting you mentioned that. I'm sure you watched President Obama's recent State of the Union, and he tipped his hat to climate change, right. and it's, he suggested that we need to maybe start spending some resources, money, to combat climate change. Can the Coastal Commission act as a clearinghouse for federal funds, or how would that work? Well, no, the Coastal Commission really acts as, um, I mean, there are some grants in, that, right. that are administered through the Coastal Commission, but the Coastal Commission really is there to protect the coast and to make judgment calls I understand. on developments. And the reality is that there are certain developments that may come before us that um, there, there may be a challenge in the future because of climate change. So certainly as Coast Commissioners, I think we're advocates. I think that's safe to say. I think we can be ambassadors for the coast. But I think that we also need to be clear that the, the climate change, rising sea level, beach erosion are going to cause challenges in future development. And so how we address it, I think, is going to be important. So how do you balance your time now? I mean, Long Beach City Council is part-time. Come on, it's sure. not part-time. Coastal Commission, a lot of time, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, I would certainly just make it work. You just make it work. <laughs> you make it work. You just However you do it, you just make it, just work. make it work. His name is Robert Garcia. He is one of the newest members of the California Coastal Commission, Vice Mayor of Long Beach. When we come back, we'll be speaking with Professor Chris Lowe of Cal State Long Beach about um, whether California should classify the endangered. Let me do that one more time. Sorry. A lot of words. <laughs> okay. His name is Robert Garcia. He is one of the newest members of the California Coastal Commission, Vice Mayor of Long Beach. When we come back, we'll be speaking with Professor Chris Lowe of Cal State Long Beach about the Great White Sharks. I'm Brad Palmer. So we'll be right back.
Welcome back to Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. Our guest, Chris Lowe, he is a professor of marine biology at Cal State Long Beach. You specialize in studying sharks. Uh, why don't you tell us a bit about your background? Then I want to talk about a really fascinating controversy surrounding the great white shark. Sure. Well, I actually grew up in Martha's Vineyard. Nice. My grandfather's a commercial fisherman. Nice. So there was really nothing to do there but fish and dive right. and do all those sorts of things. Um, so it seemed like a logical progression for me to go become a marine biologist. Sure. I had a choice. I could either be a commercial fisherman <laughs> right. or a marine biologist. Right. Um, and I had always had a passion about sharks, even when I was a kid. Um, I was fortunate enough to get my master's degree here. Oh, wow. Working with a guy named Don Nelson, who is kind of the world's expert on shark behavior. And then from there, I got my PhD at the University of Hawaii, which is another great place nice, to study sharks. of course. And so what's interesting is you didn't uh, fall too far from the tree as it relates to commercial fishing, uh, fishing, I should say, because you now work with commercial fishermen as it relates to their accidental capture of sharks. So a lot of my research has fishery ties. I'm, I'm really interested in fisheries, not just because of my my background right. growing up, but also because a lot of the research that I do, I want to see be used in a way that hopefully can in improve management, improve conservation. So we've been working with a lot of the local commercial fishermen. When they accidentally catch a white shark in their nets, they give us a call. My students are trained. We go down, we, we meet the fishermen, we take measurements of the sharks, we assess the shark, we put tags on the sharks, and we let them go. And but let me cut you off because I would think that if a shark is brought up through nets, put into this small bath, let's call it, messed with by a bunch of students, mm -hmm. and then released, survival would just not occur. Well, that's what I thought too. Um, when we first started this study, I never expected to see what we're seeing now. And these sharks appear to be incredibly hardy. So despite all the things you just discussed, right. we were shocked to see that a vast majority of these sharks survive. Why? I think it has a lot to do with their physiology. They really have a unique physiology, which is different from their cousins. Their cousins are the mako sharks. Right. If, uh, if we were to do the same things to a mako shark, they would never survive. And that brings up the issue of the status of great white sharks. Here in California, the Department of Fish and Wildlife is evaluating whether to label great white sharks as an endangered species. Now you mentioned that you were a fan of conservation. You want to conserve this species, but you're coming down on the other side. Yeah, I have to say, and a lot of it's attributed to the data that we've collected. So working with the fishermen, even prior to that, we combed through all the fishing records we could find in California going back to 1930s. And what we found was that commercial fishing probably had a negative impact on the white shark population. Okay. Um, gill netting, which became a really popular fishing method, particularly in the 70s through 80s, had major impacts, not just on the species they were targeting, which were halibut, white right. sea bass, things right. like that, but they were having negative impacts on sea lions, white sharks, which if were caught, were actually being landed and sold in local fish markets oh, as really? shark. Sure. Oh, wow. There are people that probably ate shark, ate white shark. Mm. Um, but in 1994, because of declines in marine mammals and all the target species, the state of California passed a ban on the use of gillnets in state waters. And, and gillnets are what exactly? They're kind of an invisible tight net that okay. fish swim into and get caught around their gills. Okay. Uh, it's a very effective way of fishing, but unfortunately if it's unregulated, it can actually be very destructive too. So as the result of those declines, the state passed that gillnet ban. But that same year, the state also enacted protection for white sharks. Okay. So um, it was interesting, following after that period, we saw that the rate at which sharks were being reported caught in the fishery actually started to increase, even though the fishery, the amount of effort, had been significantly reduced. In fact, the number of nets being set per year had been reduced by over 80%. But yet, there was still an increase in the great whites being captured, which 15. said what to you? So 15 years after that gillnet band and after white sharks were protected, we started to see a steady increase in the number of sharks being reported caught by fishers, even though there are very few gillnetters left. So, so that says to you? The population is increasing. So, but there's more to it than just protecting white sharks and banning near shore gillnets. You have to remember that a lot of the things that white sharks eat have been protected due to better fisheries management and have come back. So right. for example, adult white sharks like to eat seals and sea lions. 
Well, in 1920, it was estimated that there were as few as 2,000 California sea lions in all of California and Baja. Wow. Remember, the Marine Mammal Protection Act went into effect in the 70s because many marine mammals were being depleted due to direct harvesting or as bycatch in fisheries. Since then, the populations have been growing at unbelievable rates. California sea lions are growing at a rate of 6% a year. So what's the population now? It's estimated over 400,000. Oh my. So remember, white, adult white sharks like to eat those things. So in the last 15 years, we've seen significant increases in marine mammal populations. So that's bringing the adult food base back. But the baby white sharks, we find, like to eat a lot of the things that are you know, on our coastal beaches, right. whose populations seem to be doing well as well. So what we're seeing here is a form of ecosystem recovery. In fact, my opinion, white shark is the best example of a conservation success story that California has to offer. So why not list them as endangered? What would that do? So the question is, what will we do now that we're not already doing? So for example, they're already illegal to keep. So if a fisherman catches them, they have to release them. Okay. And we now have data that shows if they catch them and they release them alive, they'll survive. Okay. In addition, uh, we have protected a lot of their habitat and we've protected a lot of their food base. We know that because they're coming back. Right. So what else could we do that we're not already doing? So if there was a de designation given as endangered, what would happen? So what that could mean is if they do get listed, um, it could basically re end up in a ban of gill netting. For example, gill netting may be banned altogether in California waters. Is it banned now? I thought you no. had said... It is not. It, it, you can fish outside three miles. That's in federal waters. Okay. So gill netting is still legal outside three miles. And there aren't very many gill netters left. The ones that are fishing are actually making a decent living for the first time in a long time. Um, however, if you ban it altogether, that's going to have other impacts, right? There are going to be other fisheries that are going to be impacted as well because there's a potential that they could catch white sharks. Do you feel as if there are species that should be considered for an endangered classification that aren't instead of the great whites? Well, not, not necessarily. However, there are species that are listed now that resources will be taken away from them to help rebuild maybe the white shark population. That doesn't it, need rebuilding in exactly. your mind. Exactly. So what happens is we may dilute available resources from other populations that really need it. So a good example are abalone. Abalone in California were, were a huge industry, right? They were a mainstay. You talk to people that grew up in California, they'll, they'll still to this state salivate when you talk about an abalone sandwich. Right. But those days are gone. We harvested abalone and because of disease and other things have driven their populations to such low levels that they may never be able to recover without major amount of assistance. So if we dilute resources going to those populations to support a population that may be increasing already, then we're just, we're going to lose ground. So are people listening to you? Huh. I mean, you're on this program, you're making some noise. I know that you uh, have spoken with other media outlets. What's ha are you getting pushback? What's happening? Well, I, I mean, this is a hard position. Yeah, I'm especially a, I, as a marine biologist. Absolutely. And, and I recognize that shark populations in other parts of the world are in dire shape and deserve and need con conservation. But believe it or not, I think we've done a pretty good job in California in the United States. So what do you have to do if you really are concerned about this designation and you don't want to see it happen? Well, I think people need to speak out. And, I, and the challenge is getting the information out to the public. We are always trying to educate the public. We work in collaboration with Monterey Bay Aquarium. They have a great public outreach so program. Interesting. It's so interesting and I'm so glad you came on the program. Who would have thunk that a marine biologist would get thrown in the middle of a political controversy? His name is Chris Lowe. He is a professor at Cal State Long Beach. My name is Brad Palmer. So we'll be right back on Charter California Edition.
Welcome back to California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We are joined by Lily Singer. She is with the Theodore Payne Foundation. She has brought with us some beautiful flowers, some beautiful plants, but what makes all these plants unique, they are all California natives. And we know, we've learned the importance of native plants being grown in this region. We'll get to those in a moment. Before we talk about these beautiful plants, I want to talk about the Theodore Payne Foundation. What is it? I work at a wonderful place. Yes. Um, the Theodore Payne Foundation is a nonprofit organization um, that was founded in 1960 to carry on the work of a wonderful man named Theodore Payne, sure. who opened his first store in 1903 in downtown LA, letting people know about California native plants and seeds. And let's talk about California natives because on this program, for example, we've spoken many times about the droughts that we have been suffering. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason for these droughts is the reality is we live in semi arid desert. And the problem is, is that we are putting these green lawns that mm -hmm. need a lot of water when we really have native plants here that are well suited for our environment. Am drought, I, is that accurate? Drought is normal. That, that's, a, that's the nature of our place. We actually, in the Los Angeles Basin, where, where we are sitting right now, um, are in what's called a Mediterranean climate, which is semi-arid. Right. Um, the deserts get even less rain than we sure. do here. Yeah, I don't we, know the terms yeah. exactly, so it, correct me yeah. if I'm wrong. It's okay. You know, right. A lot of people think we are in the desert, but it, because we are so dry compared right. to other places. It's considered semi-arid. It's semi-arid, and it's a Mediterranean climate, which isn't as extreme as the desert. Okay. It's, and it's the kind of place where plants love to grow and people love to live. So California is really, really special. Um, we have an incredibly huge plant palette here. Right. There are more than 6,000 plants native to the state of California, which is bigger than any region of its size or state of its size in the United States. And what that means is, is they are used to the varied water flows that we may get exactly. throughout the year. They don't need to be constantly watered. Exactly. It's very normal for a lot of these plants to go seven or eight months without any measurable rain. So, but there are also plants in California. The reason it's, there are so many is because it is such a diverse geography and right. it's developed well, over such a no long doubt. period. So we actually have plants that can grow where you wind up the hose where it stays wet all the time too. Right. But what most gardeners are looking for is drought tolerant plants because we're all trying to save water. And do you feel as if that Californians are getting that message? Absolutely. Because Absolutely. It, is, it can be a little frustrating when you drive through these new communities and God bless them for their beautiful homes, but the lawns are all, you know, this bright green grass that you can see needs lots and lots and lots of water. And lots of fertilizer and right. pesticides and all that stuff gets washed out to the sea, and, which and, we don't want. And what you've convinced me and what I've been convinced is it doesn't have to look like a desert in your front yard. Exactly. <laughs> and that's the misconception. You don't need cactus. Well, they're actually, you know, what's, what's odd is there are actually very few cacti and succulents native to California. There you have so it. So what we have more is what you see on the table Okay, here. let's talk about some of the things you yeah. brought for us. Most, most California natives are evergreen and beautiful, and, and you can have fragrant. 12 months of color, and extremely, this so many have fragrance. This is a hummingbird sage. Exactly. Am I right? Yes. Tell us about this. It smells so lovely. This is a really special sage because it's the only California native sage that can grow well in shade. Oh, wow. And it's the only one that has red flowers and it has unusually large green lush right, leaves right, that right. smell fabulous mm -hmm. and make a lovely tea and it grows oh, really? as a, it grows as a ground cover so instead of being one big freestanding shrub this grows like a beautiful patch and you have another sage in front of you yep i brought in uh, the white two sage. sages this is white sage which i've seen a lot yeah. around this you is pretty recognizable these. in right. california because this is the sage that native americans in southern california use for ceremonial purposes okay it's extremely potent in fragrance and this one i, I think is a little strong to cook or make tea with but the fragrance may have Please, 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 please. to die for. I always have people touch oh, yeah, that it's one much last. more fragrant really, than this. Really, really, and but all of the sages have different right. fragrances. You also brought us what's called a California bay. Yeah, and what this is, is another really special plant, and also long used, long used by Native Americans. And also familiar. Um, this is related to avocados, and the fruit looks like a little baby avocado. This is related to Grecian bay that we all use in our cooking. Right. But you would use maybe a quarter of one of these leaves instead of two bay leaves because it's so potent. And this has this sweet, wonderful smell. And this grows as a very tall columnar tree. Now, that looks familiar. So, yeah. This looks familiar. Mm -hmm. This doesn't look familiar. No, that's not used as well. But if you walk through Topanga, it, um, it you'll find it growing in the wild. And that is pollinated by hummingbirds. They will which come is, to it. Which yeah. are special. Yeah. Yeah. There's something really about neat. the hummingbird. Yeah. In front of me is what's known as coyote mint. Correct. Now, I've heard of cowboy cologne plants. Right. This is different. 
Yeah, cowboy cologne is a kind of uh, wormwood, a kind right. of artemisia. Right. This is one of the coyote mints, which is related to mints uh -huh. and sages, and it's beautiful, round, lavender pink flowers that butterflies adore. Mm. And this is my favorite for making tea of all the California mints. It's got a lemony, minty right. smell, and this grows to be a little perennial, about two by two, covered in uh, early summer and through, through probably in right. through the fall, into the fall, with these beautiful purple flowers. But it, it lives one season essentially? No, oh, it's it will a perennial. Come back. Yep, that lives for many, many years. Wow. Many years. Everything we've looked at is, is a uh, perennial this here. This looks like maybe a vegetable, not really <laughs> sure, but you can tell us what it is. It looks a lot like chives. It does. Because it's closely related. This is a native onion. And it's also a bulb. And I brought that because people don't know that California is very rich in bulbs. And we're used to putting in like the Dutch tulips that are right. only good for one year. This is something that will stay in your garden for years and years. You ha actually can use it for cooking. That's what I was going to ask. And Would it you has be using this or what the grows leaves, below? The foliage um, and the flowers. The flowers look like little round uh, balls of pink flowers. And it's beautiful in the garden. And although a lot of California native bulbs need to be bone dry all summer, this one can actually go in a watered garden and can go in your vegetable garden even. Now, I'm just stunned to learn that this beautiful arrangement that you provided for us, all California natives. And all picked this morning on, in mid-February, if Literally, I may say that. Literally, yeah, all So this is California a perfect natives. late winter display. Um, of course, in the California native garden, the big rush is, of color is late winter and spring, but you can have 12 months of color with California natives. This bush poppy yeah, here flowers all year long on a big 10 by 10 shrub with this gorgeous, gorgeous uh, so blue-gray foliage. So it's this yellow foliage. flower you're looking, let me just mm -hmm. make sure the camera's yeah. getting it. Where, where are we, camera? Where do I go? Yeah. Th this right here? Mm -hmm. This guy. This is uh -huh. ever-blooming, uh -huh. big shrub for the garden. Um, this uh, coral bells are wonderful for cutting and they come right. in the spring. This is one of our ceanothus or California lilacs, which aren't related to lilacs, they smell like honey. Right. But the flower clusters obviously look like lilacs. Um, and those can be small shrubs or ground covers or great big uh, tree-like plants. Um, what else is it? We have manzanitas. I'm right. Missing. So manzanita is a very recognizable plant usually for people from California. This I noticed. Yeah. This is That's the California lilac. Right, yeah. which we see a lot. Uh -huh. And those are in bloom right now on the hills. So, so talk to us about how, if we're interested in creating a landscape, a garden with California, how can we do that without it looking like we're in Palm Desert? Exactly. So you, if you're in Palm Desert, you should pick the plants that are native to Palm of Desert, course. a lot of which would look more desert-like. Right. You know, we're in the LA Basin where we've got chaparral and coastal right. sage scrub, and that's where, where a lot of these things come from. So it's, it isn't that desert look because this But what about well, because this show, as you may know, airs statewide. Right. So would these be appropriate kind of along the coast? Um, some of them. Um, well, see, uh, let, me, let me put it this way. Yeah. There are many, many different species of ceanothus or California lilac and many different so, and species. And California lilac is, is the, the blue guy. Got it. Yeah, the okay. purple one. And many different species of manzanita. Because California is so big, we have some species that come from coastal areas, right. some that come from high mountains, some from the desert, et cetera, et cetera. So the key to doing this in answer to your question is if you're going to get started first, I would immerse myself in, in the subject. And you know, it's gone mainstream. And it it's, has. It's not, it really it's has. not just in California. Mm -hmm. I get alerts for native plants and it's happening in Zo New Zealand and Europe and everywhere. Everybody knows that you save water and resources when you put in natives of your area. You attract more of the native animals because they co evolve Right. with these plants. So you right. see more birds and butterflies than you would ever see in a traditional garden. Um, you will save an enormous amount of water. California natives, uh, it's been documented by the city of Santa Monica, a garden of California natives uses one-seventh the water that of a traditional stunning. garden. And it's stunning because I have this perception that if it's colorful, it needs water. And that's not, not necessarily, necessarily true. No. I mean, uh -uh. we are just filled with vibrant yellows and purples Absolutely. and pinks yeah. and whites. And it doesn't need to be drenched. And so many of them are good cut flowers, too. So. Right. So it's... Yeah. So um, to get started, um, immerse yourself. So go to public gardens that have right. places like Theodore Payne Foundation. We have great plants in the ground where you can see, because these are babies from a nursery. Yeah? Right. You don't know what they're going to look like when they grow up. So you go to, go to places where they have plants like the Theodore Payne Foundation, take classes. Um, there's a native plant society. There are chapters all over the state where you can learn from real fanatics Lily, that I love am these. I'm so glad you came it's to so our program. It's so much fun. This yeah, is yeah. really important, and um, they're just beautiful. California yeah. natives are beautiful. My name is Brad Palmer. So I want to thank you so much for watching Charter California Edition.